Hello, my name is Adam. I also go by Ziggurus. In this video, we are going to learn how to recreate the game Pong in Unity. This is the second video in my series of recreating old classic arcade games. Specifically in this video, we're going to learn a lot about physics in Unity. Instead of manually changing the positions of our game objects and whatnot, we're going to simulate everything through Unity's physics engine. This means our code is actually going to be pretty minimal, and you'd be surprised at how much we can accomplish just through the built-in physics that Unity provides to us. We are also going to explore some ways of implementing very simple artificial intelligence. As the player, you will be facing off against a computer, and so we will learn how we can implement the computer paddle using some AI techniques. To begin, we need to create a new Unity project. If you open Unity Hub, we can go ahead and create a new one using this blue button in the top right. And you actually can select the drop down here to choose a specific version of Unity you want to use. I'm going to be using Unity 2020.2.1 for this tutorial, but it really shouldn't matter too much. Once you select that, we can actually choose a template that we will work off of. In this case, we're going to choose the 2D template because this is going to be a 2D version of Pong. What that is going to do is install a number of useful 2D packages that you might utilize when making a 2D game. You can simply name this Pong or whatever you would like. Choose wherever you would like to save the project and go ahead and click create. From here, it might take a couple minutes to initialize, so give it a few minutes, and once this is done, we can go ahead and jump in. All right, the first thing we're going to want to do is set up our entire scene. So that means creating all the game objects we're going to need and adding various components to those game objects so we can add interactions later on. By default, Unity provides us a sample scene. I'm gonna first just rename this to Pong. And then in the left here is our hierarchy where we can see all the game objects that exist in this scene. By default, Unity provides us a camera. Let's start by modifying this and let's change the background color to black. This is preference, so you feel free to set it to whatever you like, but for Pong, I want to just have the background be pure black. And that's it. There's nothing else we need to change on our camera. Next, let's go ahead and create a ball game object. We can right click in our hierarchy and we can either select create empty, which will create a new game object with no components on it. Or in this case, it's easier to select 2D object sprites and we can do square. This will create us a brand new game object here, which I'm gonna call ball. And it's going to add a sprite render automatically to it. Let me reset the transform here. We can click the three dot menu, choose reset. It's gonna reposition our ball to the center. It just changes all these values to their defaults. And our ball is a little bit too big, so we're going to change the scale on this to 0.25. That feels more appropriate. Next, let's add a couple new objects or components to this object. So first, we're going to want a rigid body 2D. It's a 2D game, so we want the 2D version of our rigid body. And a rigid body is essentially going to turn this object into a physics object, which means the physics engine will actually simulate physics on this object. You can see there are various properties like mass and gravity, for example. For our ball, we do not want gravity. Otherwise, um, the ball is just going to fall off the screen, which is what we don't want. So by setting that to zero, it's essentially going to make gravity not affect this object. We also want to change our angular drag to zero as well. Angular drag has to do with the rotation of the ball. And in this case, I don't actually want the ball to rotate at all. It's just going to move around. There's no rotation. I don't want the ball to spin or anything like that. But feel free to play around with that if you think that would be an interesting mechanic for your game. And I can even go into constraints here and I can freeze the rotation just to really guarantee that this object is not rotating. That's it for now on our rigid body. But maybe later on, we could play around with, for example, the mass. If we want to make the game feel a little bit different, maybe make the ball feel a little bit lighter or heavier. But for now, we'll keep it. The next object, or not object, but component we want to add to our ball object is a box collider. And once again, we want the 2D version. So box collider 2D. We actually don't need to change any properties on this. 
but essentially this is just going to allow um it, a box collider is defining the shape of the collision um area of this object if we go to our scene view we can zoom in here and it might be hard to see but let me change the size just to show you oh let me go ahead and um look at our gizmos there you can see this green outline here which is showing the basically the collision area of this object now i just want to keep the size to one all their default values so it exactly aligns with our ball there and that's it so that is it for our ball game object Okay, next let's create our paddles. We can once again, right click in our hierarchy. Let's go to 2D object, sprites and select square again. Let me reset this transform back to all their defaults. And let's start by changing the size of this paddle. Actually, let me rename it first. Let's call it paddle or I'll call it player paddle. because we're also going to have a computer paddle. Let's adjust the scale. Um, I don't want it to be as wide, so maybe 0.2 and let's make it a little bit taller so maybe 1.5 instead that looks good and let's change its position to be on the left side of the screen negative eight that feels perfect i like to have it a little bit offset from the edge of the screen and that looks good that's our player paddle we also need to essentially add the same components to this as we did for the ball so we're going to want to add our rigid body 2d and for our rigid body 2d we also want to get rid of angular drag because we don't want our paddles to rotate. So we're going to also freeze the rotation. And in this case, the paddle's only going to move up and down, right? So we can actually freeze the X position so it can't move left or right. It will only move up and down. From here, we're probably going to want to adjust the mass and drag, which is going to change how the paddle feels as you start moving it. We'll probably adjust these later on um, to maybe make the paddle feel a little bit lighter or heavier. But I think some initial values is to decrease the mass a little bit because that's going to, the, a greater mass there is going to make it feel a little bit heavier, which is essentially going to make the paddle a lot slower. I kind of want my paddles to be a slightly faster. And then for our drag here, if we have our drag at zero, our paddle's never going to come to a stop. We actually want to set this, let's say to maybe two. That way, as you move up, eventually our paddle will decelerate back to a still position. And that looks good for our rigid body. We also want to add a box collider, 2D. Don't need to change any of the properties. Having the size as one will once again, um, perfectly outline our paddle, which is exactly what we want. So that looks good. So we have our paddle there. And now we can actually just right click this and select duplicate. And let's just rename this one to computer paddle. And let's just reposition this to positive eight instead of negative eight. And now we have our other paddle on the right side of the screen. And that looks good. So there are our paddles. Okay, next we need to add some walls that surround our entire game area. That way the ball stays within those bounds so let's go ahead and once again, let's right click in our hierarchy. And in this case, we don't need a sprite or anything. I just basically want invisible walls that the ball will bounce off of. So I'm just gonna select create empty this time. Let's go ahead and reset the position here. Everything is zero. And let's just call this, um, let's start with, let's say our top wall. Top wall. And all we need to do is add a box collider to this box oops box glider 2d once again this is just going to be an invisible collision zone um sort of at the edges of all of the edges of our entire game area here so the ball will bounce off of it so we just need a box glider don't need any sprite render or anything like that and all we need to basically do is reposition this appropriately you can see here in our scene view, this white outline is the outline of what our camera sees, which in the game view is, of course, this entire black area. So we want to position our wall here perfectly on the edge. So let's say 5.5 looks like is the math. And let's change its scale. The scale here doesn't matter too much. Let's just set it, set it to 20. It's okay if it goes past or exceeds the edge there. It just needs to at least be as big as that entire area. And that looks good 
Now we can duplicate this. We'll call this one bottom wall. And let's change this to negative 5.5. And there we go. So now we have our top and bottom walls. Let's go ahead and also add our left and right walls. Let's go ahead and once again, you know, I can duplicate this. Let's duplicate. We'll call it, say, left wall. Now, in this case, I need to change the scale not in the X, but in the Y. So let's set that back to 1 and instead scale it in the Y. Let's also change the Y position. Let's move it over. Put this right on the edge. Um, negative. 9.4 yeah in this case it's not going to um it's not going to be some like even number like 0.5 but 0.4 perfect makes it perfectly on the edge why let's set it's 10 there that lines up quite perfectly i'll actually just in case make it a little bit bigger once again it doesn't actually matter um yeah that feels good so there's there is our left wall and we can just duplicate this and call this one right wall and let's Change this from negative to positive, and there it goes, our right wall. So let's select all four of these. There we go. So now we can see all four of our walls, which is perfect. The final thing we might want to do for our scene is add a line going right down the middle. This definitely is not required, but I feel like it adds a lot of character. So let's go ahead and add that. We can, once again, create a new game object. This one will start as an empty one. I'm just going to call this a, I'm just going to call it line. Let's reset the position once again. And we can add a component called line renderer. There's a few properties we need to change on this. So for one, our positions here, um, we need to change, let's say the Y. So we want it, it it's going to draw a line between a few points here. So in this case, I have two points and let's say the Y is negative 10 and I don't know, positive 10. So there's our line. Obviously it doesn't look um, exactly how we want it yet. Let's go ahead and change the width here. Let's say 0.1. Yeah, that feels pretty good. And what else? We want the texture mode to be tile. That'll become important in a minute once we add um, our texture. And I'll show you what that looks like. Then let's see. Everything else is pretty much fine. I guess we can turn off lighting and shadows and stuff. We don't need any of that. Um, but that looks good. The big thing here is we need to create a material to assign to this. So let's go ahead and do that in our project panel on the bottom. I'm going to create, well, first I'm going to create a folder to keep all of my different types of um, assets organized. So let's create a folder called materials. In here, I'm going to create a new material. So right click, create material. I'm just going to call this line. And we want to change the shader type from standard to unlit transparent and then we're going to need to add a texture to this by default well so first let me show you what this looks like just as just with this material without any more changes we can go back to our line renderer here and we can drag this material into this slot here under materials and you can see our line there which actually looks fine i want to have more of a dashed line though to make it look a little bit better and one way we can do this is by assigning a texture here. Um, I'm going to pull in a texture that I already have created. And let me explain what it does. Um, and let me put this in a new folder. So let me call this, or I'll actually call this sprites. Let me move that over here. You can see it's called half square because basically what it is, it's just a square, but it only fills half of the actual area of um, of the sprite the uh, the rest of the area is just transparent so essentially it's just creating some padding around the the actual you know the actual square and then the outer edge and so now if i assign the well actually i need to change a few properties on this texture for one i want it to repeat because it's essentially just a line the line's just going to keep repeating this texture over and over again and i want to change the filter mode to point um, which is often used for like pixel graphics. Otherwise, it's going to make the edges kind of blurry, which I don't want in this case. And let's go ahead and assign this to our material. So I can select my material. I can drag this over and look at that. So in here, you can get a better visual of what the actual sprite looks like. Like I said, there's the white square in the middle with just some extra transparent padding on the edges. 
which effectively give us that, you know, the spacing in between our lines to create that like dashed line effect. I will include this texture here in um, the pro all the project files for this will be available on GitHub and this texture will be available if you want to use it. Um, you can also create one yourself if you have some programs to do so. Um, but also, you know, you don't have to do a dashed line like I did here. You can do a solid line and a solid line if you would like. It's up to you. But there, that actually looks pretty good. We have our entire scene setup is actually complete now. We have our two paddles. We have our ball. We have the line going down the middle just to add some polish. And what you don't see and will be important are four walls surrounding our edge. So the ball will bounce off of those. Next, let's start programming our player paddle. So let's first create a folder to contain all of our scripts that we will be adding to this project. And let's start by creating a couple scripts here. So first I'm gonna create a script just called paddle. And if you didn't catch that, you can right click um, in the project panel, create and C sharp script. We have one called paddle. Let's go ahead and add another called player paddle. And let's go ahead and actually create another one called computer paddle, although we're not going to write the code for that quite yet. So we have paddle, player paddle, and computer paddle. Essentially, if we open up one of these scripts, Unity provides us a, you know, a little bit by default, all of our classes inherit from mono behavior. And there's a couple functions here that they provide that are just very commonly used. I actually like to delete everything and just kind of start fresh. But here are, we have our paddle and then we're going to focus on player paddle. Now you might wonder, okay, why do we have two different scripts here? Essentially, you know, if we think about our player paddle and our computer paddle, the way in which they're going to behave will be different. However, there are definitely still some similarities between them. At the very least, there are some shared um, or not shared, but similar variables that they will both contain. So our player paddle is going to inherit from paddle and our computer paddle will also inherit from paddle this way we can add any shared any code or logic or variables that should sort of be similar or are the same between both our player and computer we can add in this class but at the same time each respective paddle has their own script that we can add you know paddle specific behavior to so for now, let's ignore the computer paddle and let's start by adding a couple things or one thing really to our base paddle class here. And that is we need to establish a reference to the rigid body that exists on the same object as this paddle. If we take a look in our scene here and let's select our player paddle, right? We, we created a rigid body. And, and also while we're at we're, while we're looking at this, we can add this script to this game object by dragging it into the empty space. You can also drag it onto the object directly through the hierarchy there. And so we need to get a reference to the rigid body that exists on this object. Let me go back to editing in this. So let's start by creating a variable called rigid body 2D, which will store a reference to that rigid body. And in this case, I actually don't. Oh, and I meant to add this to the base class here. I actually don't want this to be private because then only this class can access this and none of the other classes would be able to. So if I actually change this to be protected, that means this class can access this variable, but also my player paddle and computer paddle can access this. And let's go ahead and add a awake function here. This is a function that Unity provides automatically or Unity calls automatically on your script. It only gets called one time in the entire life cycle of this game object or of the script. And it's essentially used to do just any maybe, you know, initialization type work. So let's say, for example, we can say rigid body equals and we'll use a function Unity provides called get component. And the component I want to get, or the type of it, is rigidbody 2D, same as our variable here. And we just call that function. What that does is Unity is going to search on the same object that 
that script is attached to. So in this case, our script is attached to our player paddle game object. We're going to look on the same object and see if there is a component of that type we specified, which was rigid body 2D. And if there is, it will return that to us. And then we can assign that into our variable here, which is exactly what we want. So that's how we can establish a reference to our rigid body. That's it for now on this paddle. We'll definitely revisit this later on though. All right, next we want to actually add some specific logic to our player paddle, which is essentially going to um, look for or check for player input. And then based on that player input, we'll actually move the paddle. So let's start by adding um, a variable called, and we'll have it a vector two, and this will be called direction. So this variable will keep track of the paddle's direction. And let's add a function called update. This is a function that Unity also calls automatically. And Unity calls this function every single frame the game is running. So it's commonly used to, to check for input or, or various, um, various logic that needs to execute every single frame of the game. And here we can say if input, which is a class Unity provides, and we can say get key. And then here we can specify the key we want to check for. Let's say W. I'm going to use W, A, S, and D. Um, and I can also say, I'll, I'll check for multiple. So I'll also say get key, um, key code dot up arrow. So you can use either W, A, S, or D or your arrow keys. It's up to you. If that's the case, um, we will set our direction to be vector two dot up. Now, if it's none of those, well, let's check for if the key is keycode.s or input.getkey keycode.down arrow. And if it's that, we will set our direction to be down, vector2.down. If it's neither or none of those, well, then we can set our direction to be zero, vector2.0, which indicates we're not moving. And that's it for checking player input in our update function. Next, let's add another function called fixed update. So the difference between these two is that, as I mentioned earlier, update is called every single frame the game is running. Fixed update rather is called at a fixed time interval. So fixed update is very much associated with physics. Um, if, you're, if the physics code was executed or was based upon the frame rate of your game, then you're going to get very inconsistent um, behaviors. And so physics needs to um, simul be simulated at a fixed time interval, which is exactly what fixed update is. So typically you'll do all a lot of physics related code in here. And once again, our rigid body essentially turns this object into a physics object. So based on our direction, we can apply a force to the rigid body to make the paddle move. We are not going to just manually change the position of the paddle. This entire game, we're gonna do everything through the physics engine. So first, I only wanna apply this force if we're actually moving in a direction. So one way I can check for this is to see um, or look at square magnitude. And as long as the square magnitude is um, greater than zero, you know, that indicates that we are um, moving and i actually should probably say does not equal zero um, because if it's positive or negative that's actually fine that effectively i don't know that it ever would be negative but either way let's say as long as it's not zero that implies we're moving in some direction and in this if this is the case we can access our rigid body which once again we declared here in our base class rigid body dot add force and I'm going to say direction times, um, well, we haven't added yet, but I want to add some kind of scalar to this, um, which is going to be speed. So let's actually declare a variable called speed. And we'll do this in the base class as well, because this is going to be another variable that both our player paddle is going to utilize and our computer paddle. And in this case, we're going to make this one public and I'll show you why in a minute. And let's give it, let's say a default of, um, I mean, I don't know, it's kind of arbitrary, but maybe 10. Let's just try 10 for now. Um, and cool, that looks good. 
and then let's quickly finish this code so direction time speed gives us our force here let me show you what the speed does in the editor um, by making it public you can see in our script here now our speed shows up and i can actually modify this directly in the editor which is cool so allow me to tweak this as needed if, if i feel like maybe tends to um to too much i can decrease it i can just do it right in here without having to change any code uh, but now that that is um all written let's actually test this out let's just click our play button let's go ahead and yeah notice how our player paddle there so i'm pressing up right now and then i'm falling i'm pressing up right now and then i'm falling it looks like gravity is um, affecting us which we actually don't want so that's something we forgot to turn off earlier our gravity scale here on our rigid body just set that to zero and now gravity will no longer affect that you notice too the computer paddle actually moved as well not because of any code we wrote but because gravity as well you'll see that it just immediately falls and hey one thing you'll notice it's not going past the edge of our screen because we have those invisible walls that it's colliding with preventing it from um from going past but let's turn off gravity for our computer paddle as well let's run this one more time so now yeah i can press up and down notice and then if i let go of my keys it will actually come to a stop and that's because of our linear drag here um, if i were to change this let's say to zero and i press down i'm not pressing my down button anymore i'm completely hands off and it's still moving i press up and it's just going to keep going and going forever because there's no drag to actually slow down the object that's why we want to make sure this is maybe something like two. You can play around with these to until it feels right, but, but this actually feels really good to me. Um, the mass here, I think default mass is one. When we first set up our scene, we switched this to 0.5, just to make our paddle feel a little bit lighter, kind of allow us to, you know, kind of move faster in a sense. And yeah, this feels really good to me. It feels pretty responsive. I like the speed, everything's good. So there we go, that's our um, player paddle. It only took a few lines of code. Next, we can start scripting our ball. So let's go ahead and add a new script here called ball. Let's go ahead and add this script to our ball game object. So I'm dragging this onto our object there and you should see it show up. Let's go ahead and edit this. Let's get rid of everything by default, just my preference there. And essentially there's a couple things we want to do one we just need to give the ball an initial starting force to kind of kick it off um and actually yeah that's that's kind of it from there the ball is just going to continuously move it, it will never like come to a stop or slow down and that's the that we can all control through the you know the various rigid body properties um so essentially we just need to add our starting force here so we can actually implement a function called start and um, on start. So start will get called the very first frame this script is executed. And once this, just like awake, will only get called one time for the entire life cycle of this script. So start here and let's actually create another function called add starting force and we'll simply all this within here and in here we're gonna get the way i'm going to implement this and feel free to you know get creative but i'm essentially just going to pick a random direction in both the x and the y so the x will determine does it go to the player first does it go to the computer first you know if you want it to always go one way or the other you can hard code that it's up to you in my case i'm gonna make it choose a random direction so let's get both an X and a Y value here. And I can use a class Unity provides to us called random. And I can just say value. Random.value generates a random value between zero and one. And one way I can essentially like this for X here, as I said, it's gonna essentially determine, does it go to the left or does it go to the right? So really it's just like a coin flip, you know, 50-50, is it left or is it right? And so since this generates a value between zero and one, if I just check if that value is less than half, well then we'll consider that one direction. And if it's greater than half, well I'll consider it the other direction. 
that's kind of a, a simple way to do like a coin flip type of um, logic. So let's say if it's less than half, I'll go negative. And if it's greater than half, I'll go positive. Um, and this is our direction. Let's kind of do a similar thing for our Y here. Um, but for our Y, it's not just, um, it's going to be different. Essentially, we need to, the Y is going to really dictate the angle of the ball. And so we're going to do something similar where it's either going to go up or down. So we'll do another like coin flip type of thing here. And if let's say if it is, um, let's say less than 0.5 is going up um random and then from here i don't i could just hard code certain values in here but i want to make this also random that way the angle always is different every time the ball um, shoots off otherwise it would be very kind of constant and the game would feel repetitive very quickly um so here i can generate a random um, number between a range of my choosing and i can actually um Let's say, so if this is going up, up is actually going to be considered negative, I believe. And I want this to be negative one and like point, um, negative one and negative half, essentially. Um, and then if it's the other direction, it's going to essentially be the opposite. So between 0.5 and one, and let me explain this a little bit further. Um, so for first of all, for range here, you're going to provide the min and the max. So negative one is the lower of the, the minimum of these two values. So min and max. I know it kind of feels confusing because one is greater than 0.5, but in this case, it's negative. So negative one is actually the min, whereas for the other one, um, you know, it's, it's reversed. And this is just providing kind of, it's just going to essentially set an angle for us. I don't want to do zero because if it was zero, then our ball would go perfectly horizontal, all right, because of our X and it would not go at all in the Y whatsoever. It would just be horizontal, which is not good. So that's why we're going to do, let's say at least 0.5 and then anywhere from, you know, 0.5 to one. And all of our values here are just from zero to one, because this is just purely a direction. Um, there's no, you know, speed or anything being factored into this. So it's just between zero and one and i don't want it to be zero because like i said it will just make it flat and so that's kind of the logic there now using these two values i can actually apply a force to our ball and actually we need to get a reference to the ball's rigid body just like we did for our paddles so let's go ahead and do that rigid body 2d call this rigid body I'm going to establish this reference in a wake, just like we did for our player paddle or for our paddles. So rigid body get component, rigid body 2D. So same exact code. It's going to search for a rigid body 2D on the same um, game object that this script is attached to. And now with that, we can apply a force. We can say rigid body add a force, and our we need a vector two here, which we can construct using that, those X and Y values we just generated. And that's essentially it. Although I do want to apply a speed. So if, if you remember back to our player paddle, it's basically a direction times a speed. Same thing. Um, let's add a speed variable and not really, once again, speed here is a little bit arbitrary. I know this will need to be somewhat of a large value um, let's say 200 and let me separate this out into another variable just for clarity. So there's our direction. Now it's direction times speed, um, which is once again, pretty much identical to what we did for our, um, for our player paddle. It's just how we just set that direction is what's different. And in this case, we basically choose random values. Um, so let's go ahead and test this out. We got a ball there, speed is 200. Let's play the game. And there we go, it went up. We'll have to fix that. Notice how as soon as it collided, it just went flat. We will fix that next, but it is working. So there, that time it went down instead of up. Let's see if it'll go to the right. 
make sure it goes to right at least one time Let's keep restarting this keeps wanting to go towards me there we go now it went towards the right and let me just show you if this was you know let's just say i hard coded you know zero in here for example um i guess this code kind of doesn't make sense but let's just say this was zero the ball here will just go completely flat or completely horizontal which you know d doesn't you would never get any interesting gameplay out of that so that's why we're just kind of picking a random direction you know essentially is establishing whatever angle um the ball will tra traverse so there is our starting force. We do need to fix the, the ball sort of, when it hits the wall, it's not bouncing off the wall. Um, it's just kind of hitting or running flat. And we actually don't need to write any code for this. We can entirely do this through the physics engine. So what we're gonna do is create a physics material. Um, so right click in our project panel, create, and we will select, um, physics material which i there it is physic or physic material although there's a 2d version of it so let's actually go to 2d 2d physics material and let's call this bouncy okay bounciness zero friction all bounciness okay and we can add this to our ball so if we select our ball we go to the rigid body and here you can actually see you can provide a physics material do this let's apply that and let's try it again now look at that so now our ball bounces so what this is doing is the physics materials going to determine how when two objects collide how you know how does that affect the the simulation so in this case i said there's no friction whatsoever which is the friction was what sort of makes it come to a stop and then start sort of scraping against each other, you know, before it would sort of scrape against the wall. Now it is no friction, but full bounciness. That way it just completely bounces. And there we go. We have our working ball. We have our working paddle. It bounces off of me. Um, of course, there's no scoring yet. The computer paddle doesn't move, but that's what we can focus on next. So this is actually going to be some very, very simple artificial intelligence. Um, I can, I can almost hardly call it that cause it's going to be very, very simple, but technically it is artificial intelligence. Let's go ahead and start modifying our computer paddle script. We had already created this, but we didn't add anything to it. It does inherit from paddle though, which means we will have a reference to the rigid body that is attached to our computer paddle. There's also a speed variable that we can play around with in our editor just like oh well let's go ahead and add this script to our object and there is our speed and and just to make sure this is clear if it was confusing to anybody although our player paddle and computer paddle both inherit from the same script they each get their own unique values so let's say in this case speed is 17 for computer paddle our player paddle has its own values they're not shared they just um, both have those same variables declared all right, so computer paddle, let me reset this back to 10. Probably they should be the same. Um, let's go ahead and start adding some logic to this. So essentially our computer paddle is going to track the position of the ball. We're going to do this inside of fixed update. Once again, fixed update is where you almost always do physics related um, logic. And so we're gonna track the position of our ball and based on the position of the ball, we will, uh, we will either move up or we will move down. So to track the position of the ball, though, we're going to need a reference to the ball. So let's establish that. Now, we can't do it quite the same way that we did before. For some of our other references, for example, we're getting a rigid body and we're just grabbing the component directly from or we're using this function get component to establish that reference. This is going to search for um, the component on the same object that the script is attached to. Our ball and our computer paddle are on com are completely separate game objects, so we can't just use get component. So instead, I'm going to make this public, which now means in the editor here, we can sort of manually assign a reference to our ball. So you'll see this show up here. 
It's looking for a rigid body 2D, which currently is none, but I can drag my ball into here and it will automatically um, recognize that the ball has that rigid body 2D component on it. And now that reference is established. So in our code here, the logic is going to essentially be when the ball is coming towards the computer paddle, it will, it needs to either move up if the ball is above it, or the computer paddle needs to move down if the ball is below it. If the ball is moving away from the computer paddle, well, then we will just um, essentially have the computer paddle kind of idle in the middle of the playing field. So let's check which direction the ball is moving so we can say ball that velocity and we want the velo velocity is actually a vector so you get velocity in both the x and the y um and if this is greater than zero well that means the um that means the ball is moving to the right which is towards the computer paddle. Um, and so in this case, we want the computer paddle to then move either up or down based on the Y position of the ball. So let's check this dot ball. And we're not looking at velocity. Now we're gonna look at position. So if the Y position of the ball is greater than um, our paddle, uh, and we can say um, uh, this dot transform, position that y so if the ball's position is greater than the paddle's position well that means the um the ball is above us and we need to add a force to the paddle to move up so rigid body add force the direction here is going to be up and then once again, we can multiply this by a speed, which we already have established in our base class. All right. Now, if the um, ball is essentially the opposite here, if the ball is dot Y is less than our paddles position, well, then we will move down instead. Vector two dot down. Um, times or speed so direction times speed and if if they are perfectly equal if the the positions are perfectly equal then we don't need to move at all so that's why i could have just done else um, but in this case like if there's um if those positions are the same i don't want to do anything so that's that logic so, so this is the logic if the ball is coming towards us we also want to have a different set of logic if the ball is going away from us we could, we could apply the same logic no matter what, but it actually sort of makes the computer better. Um, if, if the computer is always tracking the ball no matter what, the computer is pretty good. Um, and so we kind of want to make, we want to add some variability into the computer's um, behavior. So it's not constantly tracking the ball it gives the player um, an opportunity to actually score. And so if the ball is moving away from the computer, we will instead sort of idle in the middle of the playing field. And actually thinking about it, by having the player or the, having the computer idle in the middle of the playing field, it actually makes the computer smarter because the computer doesn't know where the ball is going to end up when it starts coming back towards the um when it starts coming back towards itself and so by idling in the middle it's actually making it so there's an equal amount of distance it needs to cover either up or down let's say the computer paddle just stopped after the ball after the ball bounced off the computer paddle starts moving away let's say the um the computer paddle just kind of stopped in place if it ended up hitting the ball let's say at the very bottom of the screen well now if the ball ends up going towards the top it has a long distance to travel to try to reach that so actually this kind of goes against what i had said where this is actually making the the computer smarter um rather than um rather than dumber 
but it's a little bit more fair and I think it's going to make the computer paddle feel a little bit more natural, a little bit more human-like instead of just constantly tracking the ball like a robot. Even though the computer is a robot, once again, I feel like this just makes it feel a little bit more natural and adds some fairness to, to the game. Add some fairness while at the same time still, you know, the computer has some sense of intelligence to it. So if the, um, or let me re rewrite that. If the, we basically just want to move towards the center of the field. So we can check our current position. If our current position is greater than zero, well, that means we need to move the paddle down. So if it's greater than zero, zero is going to be that center point. So if it's greater than zero, we're, that means we're above and we need to move down to go towards the center. And same thing here, multiply by speed. And if it, our current position is greater than zero, or I'm sorry, less than zero, which means we're below that center line, then we need to move up. I'm speed. And that's it. And that's actually is going to complete the logic for our computer paddle. So very, very, very simple. Um, it's not the smartest player, but let's test it out and see how it works. Um, all right. So there it is sort of tracking it. Let me get a bit. Let me restart to get the ball. I kind of screwed up the ball when I hit it. I wasn't paying attention. So we hit the ball. There you go. The player or the computer paddle is sort of tracking it. And now look, look, notice how it's just kind of hovering in the middle there because the ball is going away from it and it's going to reset back to the center and it's going to kind of just hover there. So it actually gives it a little bit of natural movement. It just kind of feels like it's sort of like sitting there, like anticipating, you know, what's going to happen next. Um, and it's smart because by sitting in the middle, like I said, you're, it's giving it the most opportunity to cover all directions. Um, if it was just sitting on one end, then if the ball goes in the opposite, then you're going to have a hard time actually, um, actually reaching it in time. Um, and so, yeah, this feels good. This feels very natural. Um, it feels fair. The paddle moves very similar to how I move, right? We have the same speed. Um, we have the same physics properties on our rigid bodies, but those are all things you can play around with um, as a way of changing the difficulty of the game. You can have the computer paddle be faster, be slower. You can change its mass um, or its drag, right? So if you want the play, notice how like the paddle doesn't just instantly come to a stop. like. Those are all various things you can play around with by changing the rigid body properties. But there we go. Now we have pretty much a working game of Pong, um, but there's still more for us to do. We need to do scoring. Um, we can go ahead and add some UI as well to the, for the score. And there's actually going to be one more thing I want to do before any of that, which is I want to make the ball faster and faster and faster as the game goes on so we'll take a look at that next so to have the ball increase speed over time as the game continues on one way we can do this is by having um or is by adding a force to the ball every time it bounces off of something which is going to increase its velocity so let's go ahead and create a new script called bouncy surface and we're going to implement it in this way because this is going to give us a lot of flexibility of how we design our game. We'll be able to add this script to whatever surfaces we want. And there'll be some variables that exist on this script. So we can have it bounce off of those differently, um, off of different surfaces in a different way. So for example, maybe you want um, the ball to bounce off of the paddles with a lot more strength than if it just bounces off of the walls. So this script will give us that flexibility to do so. so. Let's delete everything. So I kind of alluded to it already, but we're gonna have a variable called um, bounce strength, okay? And yeah, and from there, let's add a function called on collision enter 2D. 
and then this has one parameter which is collision 2d and we'll just call this collision and so this is a function unity calls automatically for us because our objects um well for one our rigid bodies or have a rigid body component attached to them which once again turns those objects into physics objects and the physics engine is what simulates collisions and also because they have those box colliders which is defining the collision area it knows how to detect collisions on everything and this will get called anytime two objects collide or in this case because we're adding this function to our script bouncy service when we add our bouncy surface to some object, um, this will get called anytime that object collides with something else. And so um, what we care about is when some when the ball collides with the surface. So we can actually get a reference to that ball directly through this um, collision, um, uh, through the collision um, argument here that is provided. So collision.gameObject is going to give us the object that collided with our surface. So in this case, our ball, hopefully. Now we can't guarantee it was the ball that collided with us. And so we need to check to say that ball is not null, All right? So we're gonna try to get a reference to the ball script, but if that doesn't exist, if it's null, that means it collided with something else. It wasn't the ball that it collided with, and therefore we don't wanna execute any logic. But if it's not null, it was the ball, and therefore we can do something. And so we're gonna end up adding a force to our ball here, which will increase its velocity. And that force will be dependent on whatever strength you specify. So let's go ahead and construct that direction. Um, I'm gonna call this the normal, which is essentially the, the normal vector is the vector that indicates, um, you know, it, it's a vector kind of pointing away from the surface um, and like so in our scene here let's say the ball comes at our top wall here it's going to come in at one angle and it's going to bounce off at the opposite angle so our normal is going to kind of represent that uh, that vector that direction so we can say we can actually grab the normal is provided to us in the data that is associated with this collision. So this collision has all of the information of how those two objects collided, what, you know, the angle, all that kind of stuff. So we can actually say collision dot get contact. Um, get contact is going to get the contact point of the collision. Um, in this case, there could be multiple contact points, um, but I really only need the first one. Um, so index zero. And then I can say dot normal surface normal at the contact point yeah so the normal is once again the sort of vector pointing away from the surface at that point and then from here i can add a force to our ball now to add a force i need actually a reference to the rigid body on our ball or another way i could do this um, right now this is private i could expose this and make it public so i can access it from um, a different script well, that's sort of breaking general encapsulation rules so i'm not going to do that instead i can add a public function here just called add force right and let's say this is a force so basically anyone could manually add a force to the ball by just calling this function and the ball will determine how that happens which of course is going to go through the rigid body so really i'm just going to call add force on the rigid body so not a whole lot is happening here but it's just general good encapsulation um, and only exposing the bare minimum of what's needed so add force now i can say ball dot add force and i can pass in my vector here which is going to be our normal times the whatever our bounce strength is so Often in our, in our other cases, we do direction times speed. This is still similar. Our normal is basically a direction and strength is kind of like a speed. Um, it, you know, really it's a scalar, which both speed, strength, right? There are just different ways of scaling this direction um, to have more emphasis. Um, and actually this should be negative because it needs to go, it needs to add the force in the opposite direction um, in order for it to actually 
properly increase speed, I believe. Um, yeah, so that should be negative the normal times our bound strength. And that's actually kind of it. So it's a very simple script, but it's going to give us a lot of flexibility. So let's take a look at um, what this will look like in our scene. So now that we have this, we can add it to whatever we'd like. Um, and so I for sure want to add it to the top and bottom wall. So I'm going to select both of those. I'm going to add that there. And let's say the bounce strength is, I don't know. I actually have no clue what these should be. Let's say five. We'll, we'll play around. We'll test this out. And for the paddles, let's add the bouncy surface to the paddles as well. But maybe these are slightly more. So maybe the bounce strength is higher on the paddles than on the walls. Let's test this out. Th those values might be too much. We'll find out. And that actually feels pretty good. Um, and so let's just play the game for a minute here. And we should see the ball increasing speed over time. And we can actually test this out. If we expand this info, we can see its velocity, which is negative 5, negative 4.8. Yep, now it's 5 point. Yep, so it looks like it is indeed slightly getting faster. And the negative and positive is really, once again, just sort of indicating direction. As long as these, the absolute of these values are is, is increasing, then that indicates our ball is getting faster. And of course, we can just visually kind of see that it, it is also getting faster. And actually, those values I picked, 5 for the walls and 10 for the paddles, feels really good. I don't want it to get too fast, too quickly. I want it to be a good progression over time. Um, but by adding these, um, by making the ball speed variable, it's going to establish, um, it, it's going to allow for either us or the computer to make a mistake at some point. Um, if the ball is constantly the same speed and the, the players are of equal skill level, well then no one's ever going to score. So by making the ball speed variable, it's going to allow eventually someone to make a mistake and thus someone score. And it just makes the gameplay a little bit more interesting. And so that is, that's it for our bowl. Okay, now let's handle scoring in our game. We need to detect collision between the ball and our left and our right walls to determine who scored. And then we'll have to keep track of that score. Um, so first let's start by creating a new script called Game Manager. And notice how you didn't even change the icon for this, just because it's a very, um, it's a very common script, uh, you know, class to have for your game called Game Manager, which basically is just gonna keep track of the entire state of everything. And so, in our case, we're gonna want to keep track of score, so player score, and computer score. And we might want to, or not might, but we definitely want some functions for. Um, you know, indicating when will one player or the other scored. So let's say player scores. We want these to be public because they're going to get called um, from, um, they're going to get called externally. And let's have one for computer scores. Player scores, computer scores, and the obvious code here is the score increases for each respectively. But we also want another function for resetting the ball, basically. Um, we'll reset the position of the ball anytime um, somebody scores. And you know what? I won't even have that. I'll actually add a function to our ball script here. And I'll say, um, you know, ball, and we'll call this like reset position or something. Okay, so when we reset the position of the ball, we'll say rigid body dot, um, what we can say position equals zero. I also want to change the velocity because the velocity is actually increasing over time. So we'll also set that to be zero. Um, reset position. And then when the position is reset, we'll then add our starting force again. Add starting force. All right, so reset the position back to the center. Reset its velocity back to zero. Basically stop it from moving. And then we'll re-add our starting force, which will be another random, you know, another random direction and whatnot. Um, and that looks pretty good. 
and actually i'm gonna do one more thing let me move this up here reset position and instead of calling um add starting force and start i'm gonna call reset position and start just in case for whatever reason our ball doesn't you know if in the scene it's not lined up in the center or or whatever we'll call reset position which will recenter it and all that and calls add starting force okay and so in our game manager when someone scores we need to call that function but we need first a reference to our ball so let's get a reference to our ball now we can say ball on um, this dot ball dot reset position and same thing here this top ball dot reset position great and now let me go to our editor let's add a new game object for our game manager we're just literally going to call this game manager we're going to add that script to it now let's bring this to the very top let's establish this reference here so let's drag in our ball and there we go all's good there so we have our game manager keeping track of score um when either the player scores we increase the the in, the value and then we reset the ball same thing for computer um, but now we need to actually call player scores or computer scores when the ball collides with either the left or right wall so let's add a new script called scoring zone and let's add this to our let's add this to both our left and right wall let's go ahead and edit this delete all that um just to start fresh and this script is going to look very very similar to our bouncy surface with this on collision enter right we want to this is what you use to determine if two things have collided same exact thing on collision enter in this case with the scoring zone let's make sure it was the ball that collided so we're going to do that null check again and if it is the ball that collided we can do something in here um now essentially what we need to do is call either this function or this function now the problem is we don't know is the scoring zone for the player is it for the computer um we could have two separate scripts for for each but um i'm going to show you a way we can do this that's a lot more flexible uh, i have to import um something called event systems so we're, we're using unity's event system um api for this and here we can add a trigger uh, so we're going to trigger an event when the ball collides and so this is event trigger dot trigger event and we'll call this score trigger um, and so to actually trigger this event when we have collided we can say this a score trigger dot invoke and this will invoke our trigger now you actually have to pass in some data to this event data so we need to construct that first we'll just call this event data new event data and we need to pass in the event system that's handling this which we can just say current so there's a lot of boilerplate code i'm not really got diving into the specifics here it'll make more sense in the editor which is what i want to focus on um so don't worry too much about the code here um if you're not familiar with unity's event systems but essentially is when our ball collides with our scoring zone we are going to trigger some event that event indicates that someone scored let's take a look at what this actually looks like in the editor though so you can see our scoring zone we can add a trigger and we can provide an object we want to call some function on so that's going to be our game manager all right, so we drag our game manager in and now we can invoke some function when this event is triggered when you know someone's scored game manager and that will either be player scores or computer scores so for our left wall that's the player's wall it's actually the computer that's scoring in that case so we can we can trigger our computer scores function to be called when this event um, happens and then for our right wall it will be player scores okay let's take a look let's test this out make sure it works um let me just print out the um let me just print these out so we'll know for sure that these got called oh i guess too it's going to reset the position of the ball so we'll we'll visually see something happening if this works so if 
play our game. Um, let I'll let the computer score on me first. Let's go to our console here. I'm gonna let the computer score. Boom. So it got called. We printed out the computer score here. And also you notice the ball reset to the center and started over again. Oops. And I, yep, there we go. I accidentally missed. Let's um, test that it works when we score. Uh, so that's actually, we're going to need to just play the game for a minute here because initially the ball is fairly slow and the computer has no problem keeping track of it. And so as the ball increases speed over time, it's going to allow for the computer to make a mistake and eventually allow us to score. Um, so let's just play here for a minute. Hopefully I don't mess up. Um, I also could, if I really wanted to, I could just change the speed of the computer paddle so it's too slow to reach the ball, but that would be cheating. Um, I don't know. Can you can a can a developer cheat at their own game? I guess I guess they could. Oh, there we go. Perfect. So I scored. I scored. It showed up. Player scores. The ball reset. It started moving again. And notice too, it's it's actually back to going slow. Right. And so it was going pretty fast when I scored, and then it started out going slow again. So all of that is working exactly how I want. At this point, we have a fully working game of pong. Um, the player paddle, I can obviously move the player paddle, the ball moves, the computer responds, um, I can score, we, we're keeping track of the score. We could call it here, but I'm going to do just maybe a couple more things. Mainly I just want to show the score, actually show the score of um, the player and computer at the top. And maybe just do a little bit of cleanup here and there and then we can call it a wrap. Um, so let's go ahead and add the UI for our scoring. So I can right click in our hierarchy and I could go to UI and I want text. This is going to create, Unity creates us a canvas, which is what um, you use to actually render some, you know, any kind of UI object. So this is going to determine like, you know, like for example, you can have your UI render on top of the entire screen. You can have the UI rendered like based on the camera or you can even render UI directly in the world itself. But for my cases, we're just gonna leave all this exactly how it is. Don't need to change anything. And we just wanna focus on our text component here. Um, I guess by default, you can kind of see it's really small, but by default, we'll set that to be zero. Um, we will change, and let's say this will be the player score. So let me name this player score. I'm gonna right align it and i will um i'm gonna just have it overflow which means i can effectively it's slightly hacky but i can basically just ignore the size and um just have the text completely overflow and let's reposition this towards the top let me also let me change the color because i can't even see i can't even see it let's change the font size i don't know let's just make this like really large that looks actually pretty good we'll we'll change the actual font too but uh, let me reposition this and i can have this aligned to the top so i can i can choose there have it aligned to the top now if i change this position y to zero you can see it the you know it aligns to the top i want to maybe scoot this over just a little bit i don't know negative 50 that actually looks pretty good um, and i it, the right align is important because as the score increases, it, I want it to go that direction um, versus if it wasn't, it would, you know, it would, you know, start to overlap the wrong side there. So I want that definitely to be right aligned. And let's actually change the font here because it is not a good looking font, especially for an old retro game like this. Um, and I'm actually going to drag in a font I already have picked out, but we can, you know, uh, this font will also be available in all the project files on github so feel free to use this if you like you can of course use your own let me drag this in here we've got this font here let me go ahead and organize all of my stuff here we'll call this fonts and i never created a folder for my physics material i get i don't really need folders because there's not that many assets but it's just a good practice to kind of organize your stuff um so let's just call this physics so bring our fonts there let's bring our physical material there so now everything's organized let's go ahead and drag this font into the font there it looks pretty good nice zero 
um we need to change the y position actually let's say negative 50 yeah just negative 50 negative 50 looks really good actually you know cool 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 I actually might you know i'll leave it i'll leave it um and let's duplicate this and call this computer score and this one will be left aligned and it should instead probably be positive 50 and that definitely does not line up quite right so let's make this um 60 65 that feels more even that looks good okay cool so there we go we got our score showing up now we need to update the text here programmatically whenever somebody scores um so we need to establish references to these text uh components and we already have so our game manager is what's keeping track of score and everything let's go ahead and create some variables for our um components here so we can reference them and i think i need to import unity engine dot ui there we go and now i can say text we'll call one of them player score we'll call the other computer score on oh, also that's actually confusing because i have those so we'll call this computer score text player score text and so when the player scores we will of course change the player score text dot text equals player score to string um and then here we will say um just organizing everything this dot computer score text dot text equals computer score to string great um and i know i'm kind of going back this is, this is a little bit irrelevant or a little bit of a tangent but thinking about this reset position again um i actually want to separate out these functions from one another i don't want to necessarily assume that when you call reset position it also adds a starting force because when you if you were to just say reset position you wouldn't necessarily expect it to do this logic too so i actually don't want to call this function in there like we were doing i'm going to have these separate and um i will just sort of manually call both of them in our game manager I know it's like adding extra lines of code. Um, oh, and then this will need to be public. I know it's in a way sort of making me add extra lines of code here, but I just feel like the separation of responsibilities there is is a little bit better. Um, so we're just trying to employ some good um, programming practices. And now in this case, if I really wanted to, um, I could um, have another function to encapsulate some of this logic which I actually will do in a minute. Because the other thing I want to do is um, I reset the position of the ball. W what we didn't do earlier was reset the position of the paddles. We should probably also do that. Um, so let's say we have paddle here, we have player paddle. And another one, computer paddle. So once again, I know this is a little bit of a tangent from the UI stuff, but you know all in all right now we're just kind of cleaning up the code polishing everything adding the last details now i just want to make everything as good as possible so player paddle computer paddle and then we can call um, reset on those so in our base class we'll also add a function here called reset position just like we have for the ball and we can say rigid body dots you know, same thing we did position is zero well actually it won't be zero because that would put it into the center of the field which we don't want we need to maintain the x position we already have but we want to reset the y back to the center point and we want to maintain the x that way they stay aligned either on the left side or the right side uh, and then the velocity as well can get reset um, so it stops movement oops vector two there we go so basically the same as the ball more or less reset position and now we can say player paddle that reset position computer paddle reset position ball reset position all right so it's just like we're doing all of this stuff to reset everything when someone scores and now there's a lot of redundancy in our code and so let's actually um reset um 
you know, reset round, maybe. We'll call this a round. Um, where we can do all of this code in one. And we will call this function reset round. So there we go. A little bit of code cleanup here. It's always important to go back and um, refactor things as needed to keep your, con your code clean and fresh. And so this looks a lot better. Player scores, we increase the score. We update the text whenever we do so. And then we reset the round. Resetting the same thing for the computer. When we reset the round, we basically reset all the positions of our three main objects. And then we re-add our starting force to the ball. So really nice. Lots of different references here. But that's to be expected because this is our game manager. And once again, your game manager is usually the one thing that's sort of keeping track of everything. And so it definitely makes sense for the game manager to have those references, um, which we need to establish. Let's just drag everything into the appropriate um, field here. We've got our new text, um, our new text uh, components there too. And there we go. Is that, let's, this might be our very final play test here. Um, I guess I'll let the computer score. There we go. It changed to one. Notice how my position show we added that new code to reset my position as well. Let me look at that one more time. Boom. We reset back to the center. So there we go. It's basically everything starts fresh every time you start a new round. And let's score on the computer one final time. And that will wrap up our game of Pong here. Um, all in all, it's a fairly easy game to implement. And the great thing about Pong is there are so many different ways you can customize this, right? So I encourage everyone to get creative, see how you can change the game um, to be unique in your own way. Um, see what else you can add to the game. Maybe there's new features you can add. Right? There's so many different ways you can make this interesting. And we should be scoring here in a minute as the ball increases speed. Oh, that might be it. Oh, he got it in time. The The computer like really accelerates. Like he's slow at first or yeah, he kind of has slow acceleration, but he has a pretty good like top speed. Um, yeah, there we go. So I scored it's one to two and great resets. Awesome. There is our working game of Pong. I've gone ahead and made all of the source code available for this project. You can go ahead and download everything, the code, some of those assets I've used. There's a link in the description of the video for GitHub where all of this is available publicly. Um, I've also gone ahead and cleaned up some of the code. I've added additional comments that you can learn from explaining everything I'm doing and why. Um, so feel free to use this. You can, you can also use this all as a starting point, um, to continue building off of, if you want to see how you can expand upon the game of Pong and add maybe new functionality. So feel free. All of this is available on GitHub link in the description of the video. I appreciate you taking the time to learn how to make the game Pong with me. I hope you learned a thing or two. If you did give the video a like to let me know I did a good job. If you want to see more videos like this one, then subscribe to the channel. I will be continuing this series of recreating old classic arcade games. Next up on the list is the game Asteroids, which will be fun. A little first person game, or I'm sorry, a little shooter game. If you have a particular game in mind that you would like to learn how it was made, then feel free to leave a, leave a comment um, on the video to let me know. And I'm sure I can make a video for that one as well. If you like my work, then you can receive exclusive rewards for supporting me on Patreon. Not only do I create Unity tutorials, I also create Unity assets for other developers. And becoming a patron gives you access to all of this work. Your support means I can continue development of my next game, which you can even help contribute to. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned for the next one.